and welcome to 9 to 42, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. Join us for interviews, updates and chat with artists, influencers and those that manufacture the gear that we love. Hello and welcome to 9 to 42, which is the podcast from the guys at the Guitar Show UK. And actually, for the second time today, uh, I'm looking at my good friend Jace Hunt on screen because we've we've doubled up today, haven't we? We have doubled up because you nagged me into sorting out guests because I was sorting them out at the last minute. So I went full steam ahead and sorted out like the next six within a, two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and put and plonk two in on the same day, but at least this isn't ten o'clock in the morning. This is a far easier time to deal with. Absolutely, time to absolutely. Deal with. And this is um this is episode fifty, isn't it? It's ep- it is indeed episode fifty. Bullseye! Oh, I? Bloody hell! How the hell? How the hell? Well, we better get on to our guest then, as it's such a special occasion. We have got. We are very pleased to have John Rhino Edwards with us, who is, for the record our second only bassist in the room, as far as the podcast concerned. Hello. 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 How are you? Sober. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that. No, no, no. It's good. It's funny. I've, yeah, I've got, to, uh, I've got to go to bed early. Tonight. Anyway, so it's a really good idea to be doing something like this at this time of the day. And uh, thank you very much for having the 50th one. And who was the other bass player? Um, well, the other place, get up, can't you say it? The other bass player was Glenn Matlock. Oh, right. So that's the company you're in. Another Ronnie Lane fan. Mm, indeed. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We, we had a good chat about Ronnie. Yeah, oh, he was really, I know he was a big, like me, he's big, a big Small Faces fan. Mm. In fact, I just someone's just given me a poster from the 70s, which I'm going to frame, which I've never seen for a Slim Chance, for Ronnie Lane's Slim Chance, the travelling show they did. Yeah. I've just been given a poster for it, which I'm, for my, by my friend Simon, that I'm going to frame. But did, you don't need to know that. What would you like to know? No, bit, we should know that, because when we talked to Glenn, he talked about some posters he just had framed as well. Oh, really? How bizarre. Yeah, I know. But um, my, the posters I've got, I have to say, that they tend not to be music. They tend to be more... I'm, I'm really into um, old transport posters. Oh, right. Especially one, one chap in, in particular called Edward McKnight Calfer, who did a lot of these paintings that you, well, posters that you'll see in 1910 and 1920, like um, Twickenham by Tram and stuff like that. And they're just the most amazing things, if you like. And I've, I've, got, I've been fortunate enough to, to um, have a few of the originals, which are, is very nice. I mean, you know, it's not, I'm not, it's not like Damien Hirst territory, or anything, but they're just, I love them. They're, in, you know, they're on the walls. They're not, they're not gathering dust somewhere. Yeah. The- are these kind of art decoy type of things then? Yeah, they're very yeah art. Well, they're, they're pretty much Art Nouveau, really. Right. Know. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you'll see them all at the Transport Museum in London. You'll see the originals, and as I and uh, I mean, so, so many of them. You know, London Transport would do five hundred, put them in a station, and then when that that advertising run was finished, they'd just take them out and rip them up. You know, and of right. course now they're really they're really collectible and sought after. Am I so? If I said to you the kind of thing you might see in an Agatha Christie adaptation, is it that sort of vibe? You know, when they get off the train station at somewhere and there's yeah, a yeah, yeah, kind of yeah, like that. Yeah, you know, like come, come to Lem- Lemington Spa, Lemington Spa by the train. You know, yeah, 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 absolutely. Think- train, tram. I've got, I've got a couple of stunning ones. You know, but yeah, yeah, it's good anyway. I like that. <laughs> Well, welcome to Double O Gauge, the railway podcast from the guys at Guitar Show. Actually, on that on that topic, I ended up watching a documentary last night on Hornby. About, Hor- about Hornby? Oh, I know. Yeah. It's, a four, it's a four-parter. Is it? Yeah, it was the last part last night. The Intercity wa- Train one? I haven't watched it. Yeah, oh, I won't did. give you any spoilers. No, they, up, they upgraded. The, I know, they upgraded the Intercity, didn't they? Yeah. Oh, he was edgy. You see stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I couldn't oh, sleep. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm a bit of an age, I suppose, but I've always, I've always loved documentaries and um, stuff like that. I mean, I, you know, I like Mo- Michael Portillo as much for his dress sense as anything else. Oh, <laughs> salmon trousers. That's a statement in itself, isn't oh, it? Yeah. Oh, well, just as a small point, and obviously this is just me and you talking, don't worry about the rest of the audience for this, just for me and you for a moment. There's a bit with, a, with a, a, an amateur person who makes a particular model Right, and you'll know what I mean when you see it. So when she, when you watch the documentary, there's this amateur person. She makes this particular design, and at the end of it, if you're like me, you'll go, "Great, why?" 
So just let me know what you think when you see it. I'm not going to say okay. anybody, and you'll know exactly what I mean when you see it. Okay. I'll, 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 so, <laughs> so drop us a note. The plot films. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there. With, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I am that fellow anorak. In, in, well, well, I wasn't until last night, but I'm just, I'm, I'm starting now. Fantastic. Well, the world is full of them. I love the, the, um, the, the uh, architecture that Railways built. That's a great series, you know. I saw a trailer for that last night. I was thinking I must watch that. Yeah. <laughs> well, for those, of, for those of you watching in black and white, also, listen, Jason, you're just sitting there pissing yourself <laughs> he is, laughing. He's pissing himself <laughs> laughing. the very rock and roll nature of this. <laughs> uh, Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, indeed. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. I, I think it, yeah. I think it's brilliant. So we ought to well let let's start with the other uh, the other quick question we tend to ask most people. Obviously, it's been a crazy eighteen month lockdown and all those kind of things. How's it been for you? How's lockdown um, worked its way for you? Fine. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Moving on. Then. <laughs> um, uh, no, I mean, uh, um, yeah, the first one was more fun than the second because. Um, Basically, my, my daughter and it was myself, my wife, uh, our daughter and her fiance in our house. The weather was amazing. We've got quite a large garden. He's a, he's a fun guy. Um, I didn't argue with my daughter more than once a day. So it was pretty good, really. You know, yeah. and, uh, no, we had, I, had a, I had a fantastic time the first lockdown. And um, especially I live on the flight path to Heathrow. No planes. Yeah. What a result, you know. Yeah. And and. and uh, I'm a bit of a nature boy, you know, and all the local parks are just were just amazing. Yeah, it's it's these things are sent to try us. I mean, you know, don't get me wrong; it's it's been such a pain. It, it's uh, it's virtually killed my career. I mean, I've always thought that I've always thought that rock and roll man will will retire me. I won't retire from it, and and it's it's come as close. It's come quite close to that, really, hasn't it? With all this situation, mm. I mean, we're back on the road with Quo next year. I'm, I've done a few gigs with a couple of other bands already, but uh, you know it's all it's also up in the air. You just don't know what's going to happen, I, and I don't want to get I don't want to get my um my hopes up and then get them dashed. You know. Yeah, because the the quo dates are um, are they spring in Germany? You, did I get that right? Yeah, you, yeah, and you you just look at sort of like where Germany is right now, and you kind of like mm, well, that's what I, you know that's what I mean. You just don't know. I mean, I know of. I know a lot of other people in bands and, and most of them have, have uh, put their stuff back. I mean, I know one band, they put their, they put their tour back four times now, I think, mm-hmm. you know, and they're, and they're hopeful of going ahead <clears throat> in September. I mean, it, it, you know, and I hate to use the cliche, but it is what it is. I've, I've still been mildly creative, you know, well, I like to, <laughs> I like to think I have. <laughs> I don't care what anyone else says. <laughs> You've been writing the third Rhino's Revenge album. Uh, that typical third album, yeah. I've, I'm about eight songs in, um, and it's and um, it's going to be. It's called Never Too Old, and that's because that's the first song I wrote for it. And I am. Um, it's become a firm favourite at concerts, mate. Whenever, <laughs> whenever we've got to do them, no, it's really weird. It's got it's got a sing along course, and the first time I did it, I said, you, can, you know, you can sing along to this. You know, you won't. Um, it's not rocket science, and. Um, First chorus, bang! Everyone was singing it. I couldn't believe it. We played it three times. <laughs> one, of the, one of those, you know, one of those. I can't believe it. Would you like it again? Yeah. You know. Do you want an encore? Yeah. We haven't got any more songs left. I know. Let's play that one again. So uh, no, what I I'm, I'm, when I tour in, I'm, I've got a tour coming up in January as well to promote my um to promote. I've, I've done a live album which I'm really really pleased with. Um, do you want to hear about it? I don't mind. No, no, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, well, basically, as far as I'm concerned, especially with Rhino's Revenge, all I do, all I want to do is the people that come out, come there, walk out with a smile on their face. So the music, in a way, and the the evening are mutually exclusive. You know, as long as people have a good time, I keep it loose and whatever, mm-hmm. and um, as spontaneous as I possibly can. And um, after the first lockdown, my uh, the guy who does our sound, Dave, rang me up. And he said, um, do you know, I recorded 41 shows on Logic because he could just take a line out of yeah, the desk. Yeah. Mm. And he said, and I've listened to them all. And um, he'd just, he just been sectioned, by the way. He just come back <laughs> out. But um, he, said, it's, you'll be, he said, you'll be surprised how good it is. And um, he said, I've mixed some of them. And he sent them over. And the mixes weren't great. But I, thought this, I, I was really quite staggered how good it was because, um, as I said, 
it, it wasn't the main thing. The main thing isn't the plan. But then, of course, I was uh, that was really stupid of me because I'd um, I'd been clever enough to surround myself with fantastic players and musicians in my band who who got. There's only three of us, but they both get what I'm trying to do, and they really uh, they're really on board with it all, you know. But as I said, they're such great players and they, they with such energy that um. I, I then gave it to I then gave the, t- the tracks to Mike Paxman and basically he's kept all that excitement, made them sound inc- amazing as far as I'm concerned. You don't have to like what I do. That's fine. I don't care if you. I really, really don't care. I hate you, but I don't. <laughs> um, no, but it is good. It's a good. It's a good representation of what I do. As I said, if you don't like it, that's fine. But you, you what one couldn't deny that it's still good. If you see what I mean, it's got a great vibe to it. I, I I I hope this isn't insulting you in any way. It is, but it, it always it reminds me of like a punk quo. Yeah, so that's that, hey, <laughs> well that's why I always thought the early quo was anyway when they turned t- rock, you know, Paper Plane. I mean, it's just such a punky record, mm. you know. And and what I liked about all those early things is that I, they they were like a lot of the punks, and it was always varying degrees, but a lot of them were playing to the very edges of their capability. Yeah, and I always thought that's what records like Paper Plane were like. They couldn't have done it better if they if they'd wanted to. Mm. It was just that whole thing, you know. It was just a, a wall of noise, and they all. It was like they were all running. You know what I mean? They were, they yeah. were all running, running towards you, playing it. And I, I love that energy. That's what I like to do. Um, yeah. So no, I'll take that as a compliment. You know, I love I love being in status quo. I love the whole thing. Were you a fan before you joined? I saw a quote in 1971. I think it was a, 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 someone would probably tell me when well, they played a pub called The Winning Post in Twickenham, which was my local venue. And I think if memory serves me well, I'd seen Mop the Hoop all the week before, and then I'd seen Uriah Heep, and then I saw Quo supported by Thin Lizzy. Wow! In this club with Eric Bell, obviously. And I, I remember Brian Downey's cymbals being all cracked and broken. I like I'll take it that's because they couldn't afford to buy any new ones. Um. But Quo came on, and um, I thought, yeah, this is pretty good. You know, they started off sitting down. I think they did go and do it. I'm not sure. I'm pretty sure they sat down at first. Um, it was like, yeah, that's all right. You know, it's quite easy. I mean, you have to bear bear this in mind to the other bands I was seeing. I mean, I was a free fanatic. Mm. That was, you know, for a lot of the, like the diehard Quo fans, I was a mad free fan. Um, but, you know, I, I saw Black Sabbath supported by... No, I saw Black Sabbath the day their first album came out in Twickenham. I saw Free supported by Genesis. And um, I met Mike Rutherford. That was a real thing I really liked. I did Hind Legs and Donkey, by the way, comes speaks to mind. But I will stop after this little story that um, we did a Prince's Trust show and I was waiting in line to meet HRH and I was standing next to Mike Rutherford. And I said, I saw you supporting Free at Ilpia Lot. Ilpoy Island, and you know, this bloke about 10 foot tall to loom, looms down. My dear boy, did you really? He's a very, very nice bloke, but very, very posh. And um, I said, yeah, you know, I remember the evening so well. And he said, you know, he said, I remember it as well. He said, I remember we got seven pounds. And for some reason, the microphone got dumped in the river because it was on a place called Ilpoy Island. And um, he said, those are the gigs for me, in an incredibly posh voice, that... Um, he said, they're the ones in black and white for me. He said, once we got big, it all just, it tended to just merge into one, just one mass. And I, and I said, isn't it bizarre? I'm the, I'm the bass player in Status Quo, but, you know, by the way. And he just looked down and he said, dear boy, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that'll do me, you know. I'm, I'm a big, you know, you've got to be a fan of people. I think, you, I think you've got to be a respectful and, and in awe. And not, not, not necessarily too much so, but, um, oh yeah, I mean, I've got... Ian McLaggan, I got, I got, I played, I didn't play with Ian McLaggan, but I've met him a couple of times through Andrew mm. Brown, and I've met him in the first time. It's like, fuck me, I've just been chatting to Ian McLaggan. The lift opens, I'm going to the hotel. Hello, Rhino. So it was in the Radisson in Zurich. Come down to the bar, they've got good goodness, so I'll buy you a pint. No, no you're all right, Matt, you know. <laughs> and I went over, I thought, fucking hell, dude, Ian McLaggan just asked me for a drink. It's like, <laughs> Oh, I couldn't do it, you know. I would, I would have, I would have, I would have poured the Guinness all over myself. I would have, you know. But <laughs> I, Ronnie Lane, I, I used to see him in my local pub, but when he had MS, mm. and everyone thought he was pissed, which was a shame. I've played, I played with Steve Marriott in the seventies in France in a club. I, my Steve Marriott story is that um, we were, I was living in Paris playing in this club, and the band I was, we were walking along, and we saw Steve Marriott and his wife at a cafe. 
And um, one of the guys knew one of the guys in his band, and he and he went up and said, "Hello, Steve, is Ian Wallace with you?" He said, "No, got any drugs?" <laughs> It was, it was literally, no, it was 1976, and we were playing at this really cool club, and we, we knew where the drugs were. And um, Marriott said, oh, 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 God, you know, God, you know, oh, get out of here, get out of here, get out of here. So he got up, and, uh, and of course, as soon as he gets up, there's all the photographers there, so he's gobbing at the photographers, you know. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! You know, but, um, and then um, a couple of nights later, John Bonham turned up, and he, uh, with Simon Kirk and Boz, if I remember rightly, and he just broke at his wrist. And we had two drummers in the band, and he was, came in the dressing room, and he was such a sweetie. He said, "Look, I've broken my wrist. Would you, we're back on. Would you back on tour in a couple of months? I need to start playing again. Would you mind if I sat in for a set?" And he said, "No, of course not. You know." And um, Boz said, uh, "Is it okay? You know, is it if I get up and play with him as well?" I said, "Nope, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to miss the chance to play that." So. It was Simon Kirk ended up playing Congress, who's my favourite all-time drummer, but I couldn't even look at him. Um, and Boz was there with the tambourine. I'm not sure they were all on the substances. I, 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 never my thing. But um, yeah, that was you know. So I've played. I've I've, I've had my moments, you know, that um, that I could uh, die, dine out on. But you know, I was. Um... I, I, some people could write a book. I could write a pamphlet. <laughs> <laughs> but it would be quite interesting. I was reading an interview with a guy called uh, uh, interview blog post, a guy called Mark Saunders today, who was talking about the time that the two of you were recording with Dexys. Oh yeah. Uh, and the, the pain of Kevin wanting you to be in the pocket, which was slightly ahead of the beat and yeah. you playing it for about eight hours to try and get it. And then him ditching the whole thing and, Starting again. We did it, well, it, well I, I think that was when we were doing it. We did it. That was with, um, I mean, the most bizarre lineup: Vincent Crane on keyboards from Atomic Rooster, who was incredible. Mm. Don't get me wrong; he was a phenomenal musician. If I, I was, I, oh, more stories, but that's another time. Um, and then I think Woody Woodmansey was on drums at that time from Powers oh, right. Band. From, but it, it didn't work with him, so they got, um, they got Al Green's drummer, a guy called Tim. I can't remember his last name, and. Um, they were totally anti drugs, and he came in and said, Hey, man, you got me from my head. <laughs> they said, What, you got what, paracetamol, something like that? <laughs> no, man, you got some of my head. <laughs> so, about half an hour later, all these, all these coke turned up, but it's really weird. He played all the, he played, you know, he's playing on coke and he's so late on the beat, it's unbelievable, <laughs> you know. But that was, so that was him, me, and the keyboard player from Atomic Rooster. That was bizarre. And, and one of the luckiest men in showbiz, Billy Adams on guitar. Yeah, Billy. Billy, he was a black belt karate, and that's how he used to play his guitar. He broke. I remember he broke five strings in one song once. Wow! We, we were doing Rock Palace as well. It was live TV in, in Berlin. I looked at him. What are you doing? And I just watched the strings. Like, bing, you know, bing, <laughs> bing. Oh, got the passion. Got the passion. You know. Yeah. All right. So, how, how did you end up in Dexys? And you were there in that. In the early eighties, right? So I'm talking. Is that the big hits? The Come on, Eileen and No, I didn't. Lucky Wilson that. says. I, and stuff? I was um okay. I was on my way to a meeting with Rocket Records. I'd done my first ever solo song, and I and I was very friendly with the people at Rocket Records because I, as I was playing with Judy Zook at the time, who was that their absolute darling, and I was going up there to play it to them to see what they thought. And I was on the way to the station. I realised I'd left the cassette at home. Because that's the kind of thing I do. I ran back to get it and the phone was ringing. And I thought, should I answer it or not? And I got a phone call. It was a guy called Steve Torch, who I'd been doing sessions for, who knew Kevin Rowan. And he said, John, Kevin's just asked me to join Dex's playing bass. I said, okay, great, Steve, fantastic. He said, yeah, but I'm not good enough. But I've told him that I know someone that is, and that's you. So if you want to give him a ring, they're at Good Earth Studios now. And um, I went down there and... I said, I didn't bring a bass. I thought, oh, I thought you just want to have a chat or whatever. No, no. Well, yeah. And you've got a bass. Uh, so they borrowed me a bass. And um, apparently I tuned up using harmonics, you know, and they didn't, they'd never seen anyone doing that before. I thought, <laughs> God, this guy must be really amazing. He can tune up with harmonics, whatever that is. What are they, you know? <laughs> and then, and the key, then the keyboard player, Mickey, t- taught me a song and I went and played it. And I put in a couple of bits and Kevin stopped the song and said, 
what'd you put that bit in for? I said, I just thought you might like to. He said, no, can you play the song? Yes. Right, <laughs> play the fucking song. And then the, and, uh, about an hour later, the manager came up, the, the, one of the, like, he was Kevin's hairdresser, who he'd met in a club, and Kevin just said, do you want to manage me? And he said, you're all right then. And uh, he said, Rainer, it was a jewelry. I don't, I don't want to have to take my teeth out of you. Do you know what I mean? I said, yeah. No, no. <laughs> so, right, well, you're in. <laughs> and uh, that's why I, I met some other people who, uh, who um, I met Spike Edney, who plays for Queen. Now he's been there, the Queen keyboard player and MD for years. Andy Hamilton, who was Duran Duran sax player. Um, and loads of other people who's, who've completely disappeared off the music, off the music scene. But um, it was a great time. I absolutely adored being in Texas. I, I have worn many, many uniforms. You didn't ask me about my... I was in a band called Space. Yes, well, yes. We're going to get to get that. 70s band, not, not, the, not the band from Liverpool or whatever. No, when, um, when disco ruled. If you ever want to see me, you ever see the video for a song called Magic Fly? I'm the one that looks like a cosmic ice cream salesman. I'll say no more, but you, you, if you watch that, you will come to know. And the drummer was a guy called Charlie Morgan on that. And Charlie went on to uh, many, many great gigs, including Kate Bush. He did all her f- kick inside and all that. He's a phenomenal player. In fact, he's the drummer on one of my Rhinos Revenge albums. He came down to the studio. He talked about cars for three hours. And I'm really interested in cars. I'm not. And, um, oh, God. Anyway, so can we play? Yeah, what do you Yeah, okay, then. And he did six tracks in an hour and 10 minutes. And they were all <laughs> amazing. I mean, um, but one take. Can you change that bit? Yeah, yeah, that bit. Yeah, okay. He got, he, he'd already got a drum sound in about 10 minutes. Amazing sound. And I said, Jesus, Charlie, you've done your homework. He said, no. I listened to, me, listened to them in the car on the way down. <laughs> he's one of those people, you know, got that, got that kind of incredible memory and, and feel and technique. Yeah, he's my, one of my favourite drummers. As is Richard Newman, who plays with me in Ryan's Revenge now. He's a great player. He's, he's good fun. Heavy. He's, he, I was playing with another guy, Russell Gilbrook, before. He said, I ain't as good as Russell Rhino, but I'm fucking heavy. <laughs> <laughs> and he is. <laughs> and he's a, great, he's a great bloke. He's a fantastic guy. Well, I'm just going to stop you for a second. Well, ad break. Uh, yeah, not <laughs> quite. Only because I want to follow up on something because it came up in a different podcast I do. And that's because in the space of a fortnight, I've heard Spike's name now twice. Oh, really? So having never heard of Spike, I heard of him because I do a podcast uh, with a guy called Steve Hogarth, who's Marillion's lead singer. So yes, and this is an ad break. I'm not going to push the other podcast. Yeah, no, he's all. a nice guy. He's a lovely fella. Yeah. And, uh, but he... Oh, wait, tell him I said hello. Oh, we'll do it. Well, he, yeah. he played... Spike had a band called the SAS Band. Of course he did, yeah. Spike's All Stars. It does, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and H played in that, in that band and did a few, few dates with him. And, and yeah. it, was, it was something we covered in the podcast the other day. And I'd never heard Spike's name before then. Yeah, yeah. He's very, he's, um, the, other, the other thing that Spike did that you, you may well know of, you know the American boot camp they do when they get a really famous musician? Yes. Uh, and, and they get paid loads of money. Well, that's Spike's idea. And Spike, and that Spike does the American one of that, right? Oh, the rock and roll fantasy camp. Yeah, that's it. He li- he lives in uh, Palm Springs now. Divides his time. He's a f- he now. He is worth doing a podcast with. He's a funny guy, and he has a plethora of stories. I mean, a plethora. He's never dull. His Spike. Yeah. Well, so the 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 SAS band when H was in it, when which had Roy Wood in it. Yeah, and and had Paul Young. Yeah. Um, Sad Cafe, Paul Young. Um, oh, yeah, the late yeah, Paul Young. The, yeah. the late Paul Young uh, in it, and a few of the people sounded like a riot of a band. Yeah, do you know the other Paul Young? I hear I hear that he can run the whole gamut of notes from A to C now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all I've heard. I don't know. I mean, I don't, I've not seen Lost Pack and Lost any of that. <laughs> but, um, oh, dear. Should we have a crack at a question, Jace? Just, just yeah. for shits and giggles. Yeah, so, um, yeah, let's have a go. So, um, so we move on from Dexys. Uh, I think you're in Dexys about three years. Is that right? On and off. Yeah, I got. Um, I was actually. I was there. I, I. I was in a band called the Climax Blues Band, and I think I left them to join Dexys. And then I got the boat. Then then the, I got my friend, the drummer, in Jeff Rich, and he managed to get the bass player, the sax. So I got my old gig back. 
um, which was nice. <laughs> Welcome to the music business, guys. <laughs> and um, uh, but the, the, we were just about to go off on a tour, which I remember the tour was twenty five. We were going to do twenty six shows in twenty six days. We ended up doing twenty five. And um, phoned up the day before. Said we've got a rehearsal tomorrow. And I said, well, I can't do it. I'm going on tour with the band. I said, oh, oh. And that was that, except that they got me back in to do their album, Don't Stand Me Down, which was nice. And that's the last time. I and mean, I, I would, I would, I don't have one single, I mean, I don't have bad things to say about many people, but I have not one bad thing to say about Kevin Rowland. I, I admire the, I admire his artistic integrity. If he's made some mistakes, so what? I think he's fucking brilliant and, and, all credit to him. And if he was an arsehole, he was an arsehole for the right reasons because he had he had the the motivation and the concept. So there. <laughs> so, oh, so just one other one other bit of serendipity, by the way. Just I was talking about, you know, how things happen. You asked me how I got indexes. Um I got on, on my an answer phone in 1985. And the first message on the answer phone was from a guy called Steve Bird who probably the best guitar player I've ever played with, actually, Steve. He played on my Ryan's Revenge album. He, uh, he just drank himself to death, really, poor love. He's such a nice guy. Um, but it was a message from him to say that Alfie from Teardrop Explodes had recommended me to do the Kim Wilde gig. And, um, I, got the, and I went to the audition, and um, I happened to know that they were auditioning for rhythm sections, and I happened to know the bass player. You know, like when a drummer came, he mm. would stand in. And he said, they're going to... They're gonna, test you on this big the song called love cat i think it is he said it's a bit weird that he said they think it's a bit weird it's not it's it's this you know he taught me it took about three minutes you know but they, they sort of sort of so uh, can you play this bit you know a bit of love cats like uh, a bit difficult you know what 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 that oh yeah would you be, as soon as i asked me if i'd be prepared to dye my hair black i said i knew i'd got the job and of course, I dyed my hair black, and no one else in the band did. And I, I looked like I looked like an unhealthy version of Keith Richards. You know, it, was, it, it was that bad. Anyway, an unhealthy version of Keith. Yeah, Richards. Yeah, if there is such a thing that's alive. <laughs> anyway, Jason, you want to ask me a question? Yeah. Talk so, um, post Dexes, uh, there's a couple of year gap, I think, when looking through your history before you joined Quo. What are you doing in that period no, no. of time? In that time, um, there's a blank because I got my own thing together and I got a deal with Phonogram, but it never really came to anything. And as I said, I got the Kim job and I was um, I was with Stupid Crime Experience Band in 1984. I mean, and I was with Kim and Judy Zook. I mean, I've, you know, I mean, I've been incredibly fortunate. The only time um, I had a, a, what, you'd, what I'd call a fallow period, I suppose, was when I was trying to get my own thing together because it was good. But, you know, I mean, I can't sing. I don't care. <laughs> no, I mean, I can't. I can perform, you know, and I, I was and I write songs now that I, I feel are, are suited better to shouting than singing. <laughs> um, no, I feel so, they're, they're more they're suitable to, to a performance. Um, and at that time I was trying to sing and, you know, so, I mean, you know, it was, it was pretty poor, really. I was doing I, what I was doing was really good. It was a really, it was like funk rock, you know, and it, and it really wasn't a popular thing at the time. I mean, I, I think I'd, I think I was probably quite into funkadelic and things like that. Um, and Cameo, if, Cameo, when they were cabaret, they were amazing, but it was really weird. You go and see this band play the most snappy funk, but they've all got gold lame suits. Go, Thank you, Lynn Jones, so nice. You know, <laughs> this song is called. Alligator woman, but, 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 you know, the most bizarre, it all synchronized movements and everything. Bizarre. Anyway, no, I've never read. Really, that's the only time I had a fallow period, I suppose. And I was still playing in pubs and doing stuff. You know, I've been, mm. I've been incredibly fortunate. I really have. I'm, um, you know, you make your own luck, I can, you know, but I've, um, I've had a, a right rivet in time. I have. So post. And I'm still married. That... I'm still with my first wife. Well done. How many yeah. years? Well, I've been happily married for eight years and married for 41. <laughs> ah! uh, uh, no, we've been, we got, we've been together. We, we, the one good thing, I suppose, about how we are, she's pretty crazy. She wouldn't have it, but she is. We're not actually sure what year we got together. They were the wilderness years. It's either 1977 or 1978. We're not quite sure. Best but, way um, to be. Yeah. So and we're still, you know, that was the other good thing about lockdown, that, funnily enough, that... Um, you know, I, I, I mean, not our relationship has been based on that because we've had three kids and all that. But 
Um, I've been away at least four months of the year for, you know, 40 out, 40 out of the last 40 years kind of thing. Um, for, out of the last 41 years. And all of a sudden we're sitting at home with each other and, uh, and we actually rubbed along really well. Mm-hmm. I didn't think, I, was, I thought we probably would, but it was really great. Yeah, you know, and we like each other's company. She'd be best mate, mm-hmm. apart from Mike Paxman. <laughs> well, not apart from Mike Paxman. I'm not in love with Mike Paxman, but he's my he's my best man friend, my best boyfriend, darling. <laughs> so, so then, then obviously the call comes from Quo. Did you do you have to audition for that or? Well, I, I, funnily enough, of late I've been hearing quite a few people saying how they'd been offered the gig, and it, which is all news to me, mate. Um, but um. I, I was um, I was doing an album for a Norwegian guy called Tron Grandland as a session player. I was really starting to get quite a lot of work playing, um, yeah, playing on other people's stuff. I, and I was really enjoying doing little projects like Judy Zook. We do an album, we do a tour, then I'd go on to something else. And I really was liking that way of working because it kept you musically really active. Mm. Um, and the guitar player on this session was a, a, a chap called Pip Williams, who's and. Um, he said, I'm doing Rick Parfit's solo album, because Quo had split by then. And he said, would you like to play on a couple of tracks to me and Jeff, the drummer, Jeff Rich? And I said, yeah, that sounds great, you know. And um, that turned into doing the whole album. They were going to use another guy. They blew him out, and it went swimmingly well. And then when Rick and Francis couldn't really get deals that they wanted on their solo records, and Phonogram basically said, look, you know, we want the band back together again, you know, it's that, and that's that's it, basically. That's the bottom line. So they decided to get the band back together. And Rick, Rick said, I've been working with these two guys. And we went and had um, a jam at Gaslight Studios, I believe it was. And I mean, I'd never played anything so loud. You know, like you see in these, like the, oh, what's it called? Tom and Jerry cartoons when someone, something happens and they sort of go, yeah. you know, they're like a sort of... Um, you know, they're just sort of staggering everywhere. I came, went out there and I was, it was just unbelievable. And I got a phone call from Rick the next day to say, oh, it was so great to be able to play, to play so quietly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great, Rick. I loved it as well, absolutely, you know. I mean, when I joined the band, the two, the two rows of marshals, one was called the Wall of Death and one was Death Row. Yeah. And it, wasn't, it wasn't far wrong. But, you know, you get used to it. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty deaf now. But that, that's more down to Jeff Rich. That's me, more me trying to lock in with the drums and all, all the high end from the hi hat, mm. you know, and the cymbals. So there you go, occupational hazard. Um, so the, this would have been no, no audition though. So I was just thinking about Quo because I, I I became a Quo fan um, in 1982 when uh, they played the Princess of Wales thing at the NEC. It was broadcast on TV. I was only a kid. Princess saw Trust. It. Princess Trust. Yeah. 81 and, or 82. You right? Yeah. Because uh, and completely fell in love, bought the new album, which was one plus nine plus eight plus two, wasn't it? It was twenty years of quo. Um, was the album, and uh, and then obviously like I'd seen them in eighty five on Live Aid, like kick the whole thing off. Oh, I, I was I was in Bermuda watching that with my we met, with my, with Kath, Kathy was playing percussion for me, and we were doing a gig in in, in a nightclub in Bermuda. But it's like it's my new best mate there, eh? my new best mate. You know? <laughs> so and and that that seemed to give Quo like a, a real resurgence in their career, but obviously behind the scenes, things had been falling apart. So oh, you yeah, get... Alan didn't even, as far as I'm aware, Alan didn't want to come over to do it mm. because he lived in Australia. <clears throat> so then you end up joining a band that I suppose is on a, you know, an upward curve, really. Well, I, I think that um, it's one of those things you might have to ask Francis, but I'm pretty sure that what well, I'm pretty sure that the, the, the thought was to change the band into more of an a- AOR band at the time. You know, I mean, it was always mm. been a pop band, but Francis had found it in the army. Now the song it's written by two Dutch guys. He'd found it four years before and Alan didn't want to know about it. And I, to be honest, and I don't, and I really, really don't mean this badly because I love, I really like what Alan played. I don't think he would have played it very well. You know, it's a big, I sound like I'm slagging him, but I'm not. But it, it, it's a bit. It would have been a bit complicated for him to play, I'd say, mm. because it, it's. But don't bear in mind there was no. Um, you couldn't put anything in time then. You know, if it didn't swing, it didn't swing. If it wasn't, yeah. if it wasn't right. You know, it wasn't in. Funnily enough, Kevin Rowland. If it wasn't in the pocket, you know, it wouldn't work. And yeah. and Jeff and I were, you know, we were quite experienced. You know, at at playing stuff like that. You know, Judy Sue. I mean, you. That's very precise playing. 
And um, anyway, we did that and it was all good. And then, you know, I mean, don't get me wrong, the fans must have thought, who's that wanker? You know, I mean, prancing around like a tit. You know, really, you know, and I, I, you know, I, I make, you know, I make no bones about it. You know, it wasn't, and, and um, I'm amazed they stuck with it for so long. But I think it was obvious to Francis and Rick that I could really play, and that I was, and I was a team player, which I think they, I, I think that was a really um, a good thing for them because I don't think they'd been a team for a while. Mm. You know, and uh, and and then I met and I met Andrew Bowne, of course, who. Um, the first time, the first time I met Andrew Bowne, he looked at me, put, he looked at me across the studio, pointed at me, and said, "Plug," <laughs> at the Bass Street Kids, you know, just <laughs> plug. <laughs> plug. <laughs> I, knew, I knew we were, I knew we were going to get on famously, and he's, a, he's, we're very good friends, me and Andrew, very close. Yeah, because he's kind of like the unheralded member of the band, really, isn't he? Because he's been in quo for God, yes, probably forty years. He's a years. miserable fucker. <laughs> No, he's lovely. He's, he's um, he, I think he's, he's painfully shy in some ways, you know, not in others, you know. Um, he, I think he's half wide as why would anybody want to know anything about me? A and B, I don't want to tell anybody anything anyway, so he's happy with it. Fair enough. And he just gets on with it. He's the best Hammond player I've ever played with by a country mile. Doesn't he? He he's plays an, guitar on some uh, songs as well, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, but on Hammond, he's a beast. Mm. I mean, he's a real animal. You, you know, you don't think of it to look at him. Oh, mate, he's, you know, he's, you know, he's almost like Dracula on organ. <laughs> <laughs> now give him some teeth. He'll probably do a good job. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so what's it like? I mean, you know, Quo are, in, they're a band, they're a band, um, but Quo are an institution, right? And I think they, you know, certainly in my sort of like consciousness, they've always been an institution. What's it like joining that? Are, are you treated differently where you go because you're in quo or? Absolutely. If I'm not, I start punching people, you know, <laughs> people the thing, you know, don't you know who I am? Um, no, I got recognised today, actually. I was in Kingston Market and um, this bloke said, oh, are you, you in Climax Blues Band, State's Quo? And yeah, yeah, you're, you're that rhino. I said, yeah, I'm guilty as charged. <laughs> um, and he said, oh, yeah, I saw Climax Blue in 1975. I said, yeah, I wasn't in them then. <laughs> said, oh, yeah, in that quo. He said, I've never seen quo. I said, oh, really? Said, well, I went to both the reunion concerts. They were amazing. That dog had two head. What an album. I said, yeah, yeah great, mate. Yeah, nice one. You know, then I bottled him. <laughs> oh, you know, but you, I don't mind, you know, you get, I, it, it's, it's nice. It's nice to get rec- recognised. You know, I don't, I don't mind. I mean, as long as, it, yeah, as I said about the Rhinos events gigs, you know, it's the whole ethos with us, with, with status quo, which is why I fitted in because it's all, I've never wanted to be in a band that's, hey, very rock and roll, very showbiz. Um, I want, I've always wanted to be in a band that's really insular, which we are, you know, and it, it, sometimes it's a back to the wall thing, especially there needs to be such negative press. But um, as long as people, we are happy People leave the show with a smile on their face and we brought a bit, you know, we bought a bit of uh, happiness and maybe to forget something or what else. Just had a great time for a couple of hours. Great. You know, they've had to pay for the privilege. If we could afford it, we wouldn't pay. Well, you know, they'd get it. Yeah. Do, you, do you find that, though, that that negative press, and I think we, you know, we all kind of are aware of that negative press has actually changed. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, you, you well, seem to have gone full circle. Well, it's changed since the band's become mainstream, you know. I mean, how many more bloody interviews are you going to read about Francis Ross's septum falling out? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's all the same questions. I mean, this is great doing this because at least, A, I'm not, I've, apart from my, uh, my, my my next hundred seller that I'm trying to promote here. Um, <laughs> you know, I've got nothing, I'm not trying to promote, it to, well, I am trying to promote something, but I, I'm not, um, I don't have to do the same interview time after time, you know, saying about, you know, cocaine, Drugs, sex, uh, 158 trillion billion albums sold, you know, how does it feel? Live aid, you know. I mean, so I've got so much respect for Francis for not just saying, shut up and fuck off. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Don't ask, yeah, yeah. Ask them uh, good questions. But I, it's nice to get recognized. Anyway, move on. Oh, no, I've always said we're great music to be drunk to, you know. 
<laughs> no, and I mean that in a nice way. You yeah. know, have a couple of drinks, loose, you know, and and and, for, and forget, you know, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag for a couple of hours, you know, and have a good time. Absolutely, you know, we're not we, we're not um trying to challenge anybody. You know, it's not like mm. listen to our new album. Oh, I've got a great Neil Young story. Yeah. He, um, his, his new album came out. And he's playing some gig somewhere and he played the whole, and it was out that day and he played it his entirety and no one had heard it. And, That's uh, very Neil Young. Yeah. And he said, okay, right, I'm going to take a short break now. And he said, look, I promise you, I promise you that when we come back, you'll, you, you'll have heard every song that we're going to, you'll have heard every song before. And they came out <laughs> and played it again. <laughs> <laughs> Well, now, now that's rock and roll. <laughs> oh, I love Neil Young. Yeah, I like <laughs> it. All, you don't, again, he's one of the, you don't have to like him, but you've got to admire him. Although yeah. he gave his wife of 38 years to go for Daryl Hannah, which is not a bad thing in itself. <laughs> Even your wife of 38 years is shit. <laughs> he is. It's shit. Yeah. It's not well. Yeah. Well, it's really shit. So, I, I mean, I, are we able to touch on Rick? Because um, I booked... Yeah, of course you can. I, I took... I, I booked Rick many many years ago when i was running a music event at the nec and he turned up and he was just absolutely everything that i ever wanted from rick he, from he a got, rock star. oh he's a rock star yeah i mean he got he turned up in a rolls royce he was wearing a fur coat you know and he sat in the green room having a drink and he was just he was a lovely bloke he must have borrowed that off his girlfriend <laughs> I get the impression that you two were quite close. Obviously, yeah, you... we were. We, we were for a very long time. We drifted apart then for the last three or four years because I'm not. In, I mean, I I really love people that are rock stars, but don't be a rock star when you're when you're in a band with me. Yeah, so I wouldn't do that. To, I wouldn't do that to you. Um, but no, that's about it, really. And he, and Rick could throw a custard pie, you know, what I call a custard pie. He could be really a bit of. He could be a right arsehole sometimes, but it wasn't often. And um, you had the choice to say, oh, fuck it and forgive it, you know, forget it. And it would quite, it quite often be very apologetic. Um, but at the same time, he's the funniest bloke I ever knew. Um, I got sepsis once. Well, luckily only once. <laughs> and, uh, and I got really sick on it. And I was in the hospital and I got an email from him. And um, it was so lovely. It was really lovely and warm email. My dear Rhino, I had no idea, you know, that, you know how bad things had been. And just to let you know, you know, I've really been thinking about you and I'm really worried about you. And if there's anything I can do for you, fuck off and get someone else to do it. <laughs> you know, that was, just, that was Rick. That was, it made me laugh my head off, you know, which is what I really needed at the time. And um, no, we were very close. Yeah, we, li- we lived around the corner to each other. You know, we really used to hang out a lot. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's great. You know, it's great. Shawaddy Waddy said it. The band that plays, to- the-, the band that plays together stays together. You know, and um, yeah, we were. There was a time when the whole band around around the time of the pictures stuff we did, um, like and, and heavy traffic from heavy traffic to, to the noughties, if you like, to the end of the noughties. That was good. That was a good time. And the drummer, mm-hmm. the drummer, before he lost the plot, was really fine. Around the time we did an album called Heavy Traffic, and we were really seriously rocking on that. I mean. Rick would come off stage sweating that, and he just comes and that's what I do this for. Mm. You know, we absolutely, we were really brilliant. And then um, the drummer kind of, the drummer started, he started, was hitting the drum so much, he started doing his elbows in, the, the sticks got lighter and lighter and he got more and more fed up with the volume. So in the end he left. <laughs> nice guy, very quiet, but he left. <laughs> <laughs> and now, and now, we're, and now um, we, we're a happy band. You know, we've got um, um, the, the replacement for Matthew Letley uh, is, is a, a lovely, lovely guy called Leon Cave. Leon's much younger. You know, we, we me, Francis, and Andrew call them the kids because the, the guitar player Richie, who's got three, he's got three children under six. I think. Oh, when he joined, he had three under two. Uh, I got he. I, I um. When when Rick got when Rick got sick, my Freddie took over. My son Freddie yeah. took over a while, but he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to. He was really into his own band, which is funny. He just came back from LA from a writing session today. They're they're doing all right. Flaws F L A W E S, ladies and gentlemen, check them out. I think they're amazing. Three piece, no bass player though. That's their downfall. <laughs> um, um, yeah, Richie. Um, I said to Francis when Freddie, they, they were begging Freddie to stay. 
And he said, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm stopping. And um, cause I think he thought, I think Francis was probably interested in stopping the band anyway at that time. And we got this guy, Richie and who, and um, I'd known him and he'd known Rick. And I, I, I I'd always kept in touch and I had his number and I rang him up and I said, Hey, Richie, well, hello mate. How are you? You know, I said, yeah, I'm good, good, good. Um, how would you fancy doing a few gigs with Quo? And it went quiet and he went, yeah, all right then. And I knew in that instant he could do it. He did tell me a couple of years later that he nearly drove the car into a tree. <laughs> 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 but um, he, um, you know, he, he came along two days rehearsal, straight out to a, straight out to a headline in 12,000 capacity show. But as soon as Richie, when Richie said to me, you know what? I knew he could do it. Do you know what I mean? I just, I, I, I then checked out whether he, his time was good enough, which it was. And it was a Rick freak. I mean, he knows more Quo songs than I do, you know, including ones I've written. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he's, um, he's, he's a real sweetheart. We're a real, it's a real, it's a happy band of brothers now. Excellent. Yeah. So uh, you got, got uh, well, it's not a full year's worth of touring, is it, next year? But you've got the spring and then you've got the sort of late autumn yeah, into winter. And- yeah, and also, I mean, we're doing, we've got we've got 12 dates in January for the live album. And hopefully, well, I mean, I know I will. I'll, I'll have my Never Too Old album out ready for next year sometime. And I'm hoping we'll be touring that somewhere around October if I've got time off with Quo. Because, um, of course, with COVID, you know, we've got, we actually do quite, we, well, we do quite well in Europe. Mm. And I've got, a, I've got a fair few offers of gigs in Europe, which we can't do. Mm you know, because of the COVID situation. So hopefully we can sort of, you know, get that all going. I mean, it, it, t- it took me 15 years, I think, 14 years between my first and my second album. And this one will be six years. So I'm getting there in the end, but it, this will be the last one. So a lot of people can start clapping their hands now. <laughs> but, um, no, it's, it's tough, you know, it's, it's writing songs is tough. I don't, I don't want to write a song that, does, that doesn't say anything. Mm. I'd like to make some kind of commentary, even if it's, you know, stupid. I still like to, I, I don't, I can't do Moon in June. And you, baby, you broke my heart, you know. Yeah. yeah. Although Spooky Tooth, remember them? Were you heard of them? Yeah, yeah. They had the great album, like, you, broke, babe, you broke my heart, so I busted your jaw. <laughs> <laughs> I saw the album title. It was like, I mean, you know, back in the day, but it did <laughs> make me laugh. So do you, when you're writing for yourself and you write for Quo, are they very different ways of writing? Do you know yeah. instantly when one's for you or one's for Quo? No, I normally what happens is Francis will send me some bits and bobs. Um, he's not, does, he hasn't for a while, he doesn't, but um, he'll send me bits and bobs. And, and uh, as often as not, because he won't give me a one, a one he doesn't count it in. There's, there's a song... Um, on, on, on our last album, Backbone, called Cut Me Some Slack. And it's a shuffle, but the, the way I heard it, he heard it on completely the other beat. So when I <laughs> sent it back to him, that's not what I was expecting at all, but I love it. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, and um, we did another song called Liberty Lane, and he just he sent me a guitar riff. And I just got sent. You know, the thing is that for me, we did a song called Two Way Traffic and the, the bit, there's a, it's, it's not a big input from Francis, but it doesn't matter. I just think songwriting's about being in a room, man. Uh, you know, I'm talking um, esoterically or whatever the word is. Um, and if, if something that someone sends you or says puts you in a room, for me, that's, for me, that's 50% of the song written. Mm. You know, the rest of it, the, you know, once you go, oh, okay, I'm in that room, right. I'm going to stay in this room till I come out. Till I come out the door or something. Yeah, I mean, I know this is a bit deep and meaningless, but um, that's uh, that, that's that's how I work. Um, with you, with me again, I don't have to have co-writes with myself, luckily. Um, <laughs> so if I yeah, once I get once I get an idea, I'm writing one at the moment. I saw some I, I saw someone I know who's having an affair, and they weren't making a secret of it, and um, it really upset. It really pissed me off because I know. I know the other person involved. And if they know that I know and I don't say anything, then they'll never speak to me again. Yeah. You know, for having known it. And it puts me in. So I'm basically, this song's about, don't tell me the truth, just lie to me. So you're blue in the fucking face because that's all I want to hear. You know, 
because it's a much better idea in a funny way. I don't want to know the truth because the truth the truth hurts. And lies can do, but there's less chance. <laughs> Just selective with them, man. So I've I've only got two things left written down, actually. Yes, I am. Um, no, uh, Brentford FC. Yep. Which um, probably Ant will take that one, given that he's a season ticket holder at Sheffield United. Oh, are you? Oh, I I've am been, indeed. I've been there. I actually went up to see a one-all draw. Josh McCracken scored for Brentford about six years ago on a Tuesday night. Proper football, freezing cold. Oh, it will have been if it was a Tuesday night. Uh, yeah. there's, there's no better night of football than Tuesday night at Bramall Lane. There really isn't. <laughs> there is. Uh, Griffin Park. Uh, no, well, well, Griffin I, Park's I, not there. I got in just before, um, just before they moved. Oh uh, right, well, and, and and had a great evening. Uh, and I think I don't know if we didn't beat you. It was about three did. years ago. It was the season you went up. Yeah, it was. Yeah, uh, I'm pretty sure it's two one. I wasn't was a, there. That was a Tuesday night as well, I think, or a Wednesday yeah. night. It was an evening oh, game. Oh, great! That's what proper football's about. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I thought it was a fantastic ground. Um, in the space of two years, I went there, I went to QPR, and I went to Fulham, all for the first time. Yeah, Griffin Park is the best by miles. Um, <laughs> no, oh, it, oh, come on, come no, on, is, Fulham's it, it, all right. Got, listen, how many pubs has Fulham got on the corners? <laughs> <laughs> the old ground had a pub on every corner. Uh, yes, it did. Oh, yes. I know it did. Of course yes. I did. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm educating you here, Ant. And, um, <laughs> That's really kind of you. Thank you. Also, it was a small ground, so you were really close to the pitch. Yeah, you were. You could, stand, you could still stand behind the goal. Um, there, the, 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 ethnic, the ethnic and mix of sectors at Brentford is like no club I've ever seen. It's fantastic. You just, it, it's, a, it's a completely inclusive place. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just loved it there, and and I I like the new ground. I hate the Premier League. I hate it. It's, well, I hate, I hate the cheating. They all cheat. They all, I, you, know, you kick someone on the toe, they grab it. They, they, you know, it's like they they've like they like they've lost their eye socket. <laughs> <laughs> There's uh, something about as well playing your football on a Saturday afternoon on a Tuesday evening. Oh, totally. That's well, that's because that's when you should play your football. Yeah, but it's not just that. You know, I mean, I, I I've. When the football's good, and, and I've, I've watched some great teams there, and I gave away my ticket for one of the great games, they said, of the Premier League ever, which was at Brentford and Liverpool, drew three all about two months ago. I gave my ticket away because I thought we were going to get spanked. When the football's good, I love it. But what I hate is we, we watched, I went to watch Leicester City play, and their goalkeeper was time-wasting from the first minute mm. because it's all about money. It's mm. not about the game. No, It's just all about the cash. And the way they, the way they dive around... It's just hope, you know. What they try, they're trying to get other people in trouble. They're trying to waste time. That's not about football. It's not a sport. No, it's money. If we go down, if we go down, I'm totally happy with it. Just please don't sack the manager. Don't be like all the other fuckers. Be a well, like us for a start. You know, well, that was no, that was. I also that was a bit different with him. You didn't. You gave him a lot of chances, and it was. I think he realised he had to go. I don't know if he got no. supported in the way he should have been supported in terms oh, well, of the, there you. Well, the I can I can tell you that our man I can tell you our manager is back to the hilt by the owner and the players. They would run through walls. With, most of them aren't good enough for the Premier League. They hardly changed the team when they went up. We've got eight players that are good enough for the Premier League and forty players in the squad. And out of those eight players that are good enough, three of them are injured, so we're struggling. Yeah. But if we go down, so be it. Yeah. Well, if well if you do, then then let us know if you want to come up to Sheffield for a match next season. And yeah. I've been there once, dear boy. <laughs> oh, you can manage it a second time. It's not doing any harm. Not doing any harm. I've been uh, I've been to Hillsborough as well. One of the best days of my life. Went for beat Hillsborough two one. I went absolutely. We had a day off in Liverpool. I got the train over. I basically, one of our players got sent low after 10 minutes. They scored. But I didn't see the ball till the 88th minute. And then we scored two goals right in front of us. <laughs> I went ballistic. I've never gone so vape shit at a football match. Sorry, I, I, sorry, Jason. No, no, because you, you, wrote a, you wrote a song, didn't you, for Lloyd Owusu? I've written a few Brentford songs. I did one, for, I did one yeah, when we, another one when we lost at Wembley. I did one for the uh, fake Rover. Yeah, I did a song for Lloyd. I mean, it's the gayest football song. Am I allowed to say that? You've said it. Yeah. It's, it's a lim- limpest football song. I mean, of course, it's a wusu, a wusu. I mean, come on, what was I thinking? However, who cares? You know, why can't you do a song, you know, 
It's, um, you can find it on the interweb. It's on YouTube. You know, it. Um, at the time, it had. I did it as a free download. At the time, downloading was in its infancy, and I and I actually found out that if if the people that downloaded it had, had paid downloading, which I think they would have done, it would have got to number twenty one in the chart. So, oh whoosu, oh whoosu, <laughs> could have had uh, his name in lights. But I'm still friendly with him. He's a lovely guy. Brentford supporter through and through. It lives in uh, Australia. Every time we've been in Australia, we've got we've got together and, and gone out. And he's a, he's the nicest man. Huh. Oh, you know? oh, fantastic! It's nice to hear, isn't it? I mean, you know, I'm, footballers are my heroes as well. You know, I mean, I I get I get all um, starstruck around a footballer, even though there's no reason to. But you know, that's the well, way it is. You've got to have hero. You've got to have heroes, even if you're old enough to be their great grandfather. <laughs> And and you know what Brentford proper football club always had a lot of time for Brentford always thought and Sheffield really... United no shit Richard yeah. Cadet went to you he did blooming yep. heck that's Ooh. going back Richard Cadet oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah. okay are you happy uh, uh, Jason you have one more question uh, it's only you were on the young ones that's the only thing I've got written down right well then, you know that's yeah go on and it was just kind of like uh, because I, I mean certainly for me and Ant when we were sort of teenagers, like the young ones was the greatest TV programme in the world ever. Well, yeah, what, well I'm what actually was... one of the greatest people in the world ever then, aren't I? Really, Jason? Yes, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> let me tell you, let me tell you, I got the job, I got the, the gig, sorry, job. I don't work. I've never worked. <laughs> um, I, got, I, got, I got the gig with Dexys and I got a phone call the next morning, but I'll pass it this morning. Do you want to do a TV show today? And I lived in Chiswick. I said, yeah, great, you know. And they said, right, get over to the television centre. And it was the first series of The Young Ones. And me and the keyboard player, Mickey, who I only just met, but not great guy, um, said, come on, let's go and have a look at the rehearsals. So we went to look. We were watching the rehearsals for the first series of The Young Ones. We went, what the fuck is this? <laughs> this is absolutely mental. And, of course, they were taking it really seriously as any proper comedy, you know. So, oh, what about that? Well, you know, was it? I think it's the one with the bomb. I'm not sure that we were in. Mm. And anyway, and um, and I remember Q Dexter's midnight runners in the bathroom. <laughs> do, 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 do. I remember thinking this is one of the more bizarre things I've done. However, I have done more bizarre things. I was a gas cooker as well. When I was um, a struggling musician, I got a job um, advertising gas for the gas board and you either wore a clipper uh, a clapper board whatever they were called you know around you yeah, yeah. sandwich board sandwich board or yeah. you had a cooker and they had taken all the insides out of the cooker they'd left the door and taken off the rings and put a piece of wood on and you've got into the cooker and put your head up so this thing called the offer right? so i have been a gas cooker which was great <laughs> when we except when we were walking down walthamstow market someone lipped one of the uh, market traders and they started throwing vegetables and fruit at us. <laughs> and we couldn't do a bloody thing except scuttle off. He's just met these, these little cookers scuttling through the market. <laughs> oh, I've done lots. I, I used to wear chain mail when I worked with Sandy Shaw. Um, <laughs> yeah, space is bizarre. If you think about it, I'm, I mean, I'm a man of many um, sartorial looks. <laughs> but anyway, that, that's the young ones, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah no, I've, hey, I, I've had the most amazing innings. I've no complaints. I wouldn't, but I mean, really... My memoirs would be a pamphlet. They wouldn't be a book. I've not really known. I wouldn't like to pad them out, you know. Some are padded out, I'm sure. If Spike ever does his, read them. They'll be hilarious. Right, right. Rainer, that's but, just been amazing. I mean, yeah. I have not laughed as much on a, po- a recording of this it's podcast. It's the 49th one. Since, since, <laughs> since this morning. <laughs> but um, And that was with a Finnish guitarist. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, I have not laughed as much on 1942 oh. as I have laughed this afternoon. Oh, because you know what, one thing, Yingmi Weinstein, I love one of his quotes. I mean, he's a bit of a dick. But, um, <laughs> he is, you know. Um, <laughs> and he's Swedish anyway. But um, he said, what is this less is more shit? <laughs> so, yeah, okay. I get that. That's all because you're like, what is less is more shit? Anyway. <laughs> Okay, on um, that bombshell. On, on that, that bombshell, bombshell. Listen, I hope look. I hope you get out on all the gigs you want to get to next year. Good luck with the live come. album. We're playing. In, we're playing in Birmingham. Oh yes, playing at the Asylum, aren't you? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm mad, mate. That sounds about right. <laughs> um, yeah, I hope so. Um, yeah, I know we're going. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I won't be playing with my normal guitar player. I've got. Have you heard of a band called Romeo's Daughter? 
Yes. Yes. Well, Craig, the guitar player from Romeo's Daughter, who steps in. Although Craig did have the um, the temerity to have a heart attack on stage with me in oh, Germany well. about five years ago. That was, a, that was a, a strange scenario, but we didn't stop. Freddie was on the. Freddie was out the next day. That's rock and roll for you. <laughs> we flew out to Germany. Yeah, that, that was that was a weird moment, mate. I don't feel so good. <clears throat> Is it my music? <laughs> Is it the song? No, and then and he had a major heart attack. And so, um, you know, I'm hoping he doesn't do the same again. Well, I'm sure he won't. He's a sweet, he's the nicest bloke you'll ever meet, is Craig. As is Jim Kirkpatrick, by the way. Jim Kirkpatrick, who plays with FM, is another one who is playing with Band of Friends at the moment, which is a Rory Gallagher thing with um, McAvoy, Jerry McAvoy. He's uh, an amazing player. He's got his own solo career out as well. So I'm bigging Jim up as well. Jim Kirkpatrick, ladies and gentlemen, a name for the future. As opposed to me, I'm just beyond the grave. <laughs> All right, folks. Thank you very much. Enjoyed oh, it. Very much. Right, Thank you. Been, that was brilliant. It's been amazing. It's been See amazing. you later. All right. Cheers. 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 Bye. Take care. Bye. And that, <laughs> and that was John Rhino Edwards. That was amazing. I, I don't, don't quite don't know what to it. say. I'm not. Just, I'm not. I, well, we've only got the Zoom recording because yeah. um, because to to try and get uh, I don't know I, I don't know where John would have been able to record but um, but we've got the Zoom recording so there's not a lot we can do with it anyway so we'll just stuff but I think it needs to go out exactly as it is it does really um, that was just that was a hundred miles an hour really yeah. <laughs> I think I need, I need a little lie down <laughs> well, I'm gonna go and get my um flu jab in get, a minute so. your, COVID, your covid booster no no think, the flu jab tonight oh, COVID booster is next week right. so i'm looking forward to two ill days in the space of a week um we we should say thank you because um we've got to 50 so thanks for everybody who's listened thanks for everybody who's supported us huge thanks to focus right uh who've been such a big part of this this journey um with us uh couldn't have asked for a better guest uh, for number 50 um, than Rhino. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, what stories? I mean, he's bonkers, but <laughs> what stories? Uh, and and, uh, and and it'd be lovely to get him to the show, um, you know. Um, but no, absolutely superb. And Jace, it's been a treat. Um, it has been a treat. I Yeah, given that I was the reluctant podcaster 50 episodes ago. I know, unbelievable, isn't it? Got this quite, far. Quite enjoy it. Yeah, it's to not. the next fifty. It's to the next fifty, you know, and we'll just keep the ratio about the same: two bass players for for every forty-eight guitar players. <laughs> and, and I think I think we'll be about right. Uh, you know, that, that'll the bad work, won't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, we were talking about getting a drummer on. So yeah, yeah, the jury's still out on that. <laughs> we, we're still having, we're still having. Oh, not quite sure about that one. But no. Um, so thanks everybody for listening, for taking part. A big shout out again to to, to Focus Right. And we will we'll be back uh, we'll be back with with fifty one fairly shortly. Thanks for listening to Nine to Forty Two, the podcast from the team at the Guitar Show UK. If you've enjoyed the show, then please remember to hit the subscribe button and share with other like minded souls. For more information about Nine to Forty Two, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at the Guitar Show UK. This has been an A Short Stories production.